Well, it's preaching time. Take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of John, please. John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter number 13. John, chapter number 13. While you're turning, I heard about this missionary who was going to Mexico, thought he'd get a jump on language school, and he bought a set of Rosetta Stone Spanish CDs at a yard sale. And... Um, put them in every night when he would go to sleep and listen to them on his headphones, go to sleep. And, um, well, what he didn't know was that they were scratched. They were scratched and they skipped real bad. Now, after a couple of years of doing that on deputation, he learned the language, but he stuttered like you would not believe. <laughs> Come on now. Are you in John 13? Stand with me, please. John 13. Let me read a couple of verses and then we'll pray and you can be seated. John chapter 13, verse number 33. Jesus said, little children, yet a little while I'm with you. You shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, so that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. I wanna preach this morning on the thought, I love my church. You say, well, Pastor Schiff, don't even use the word church in that verse. In any of those verses, well, it doesn't have to for me to love my church because when I say I love my church, I'm not saying I love this building. I love the sheetrock or the carpet or the parking lot, at least not yet, amen. I'm gonna love the parking lot pretty soon, but amen. the church is made up of the people of God. Amen. And if we love one another, as Jesus said we should, then we will love our church, amen. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to stand and just proclaim your word and encourage the hearts of your people. Or if there's somebody here today that's never been saved, I pray the day would be the day. Lord, that they are convicted of their sin, they're drawn to the Savior. Lord, through the gospel message, may the people of God, the church of the living God today, I pray, be stirred and challenged in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. For several weeks, I have been praying about what to preach today. I love the church, I love my church, I love this church, I love you. And I thought, man, what can I preach on I Love My Church Sunday? And I thought to myself, this uh, last couple of days, getting ready for Sunday, even though I was on vacation, I was working, I was preparing, I was studying, I was jotting down notes, I was thinking and praying about today's services. And I thought, well, what a better way to preach uh, uh, on I Love My Church Sunday than to preach a message entitled I Love My Church. And you say, well, preacher, is it, is it biblical? I don't, you know, I don't, Pastor Shifflin, I don't want to be too quick to say I love my church because, you know, I don't want it to, everybody else to think I don't love their church. That's not what we're here for, and that's not what we're trying to do today. You know, it's kind of like saying I don't want to tell my wife I love her because I don't want all the other ladies in the world to think I don't love them. You know how dumb that sounds? And in our Bible, we find several things by way of introduction that, uh, that, we could, that we could draw confidence and we can rest assured that it is okay for us to have a, I love my church Sunday. It's okay to say I love my church. Three things by way of introduction quickly and then we're gonna get right into the meat of the message. In our verses, we see here, uh, number one, the expression of Jesus Christ. It was no secret that Jesus loved his church and he expressed that Often, in fact, in Ephesians chapter number five, in verse number 25, when it's talking about the home and the marriage, it says, husbands, love your wives, and then it gives us a comparison, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So it is no secret that Jesus often and boldly and with confidence and unashamedly proclaimed his love for his church in fact, in John chapter 15, 
and verse number nine, just a couple of pages over, here's what Jesus said, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. He's talking about the people of God. He's talking about the local church. Down in verse number 12, this is my commandment of John 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus often expressed his love to his church, reminding them that he loved them and that he supported them and that they were important to him. Can I tell you something this morning? It is okay to say, I love my church. Jesus expressed his love to the church. Not only do we see the expression of Jesus Christ, but secondly, in this matter of loving the church, we see the example of Jesus Christ. Look at what he says in our text verse, verse number 34 of John 13. A new commandment I give you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. He said in that statement, he's not only saying, I love you, I love my church, I love the people of God, but he said, I have set an example with my life and I want you to follow my example, and I want you to love the church like I love the church. I want you to be confident, and I want you to be vocal in your love and your passion and your support for the body of Christ just like I am. That's what Jesus was saying. As we were driving home yesterday from Williamsburg, Virginia, and like I said, it only took us five hours to make a three-hour trip. I think everybody north of the Mason-Dixon line was on vacation and coming home yesterday. And as we were coming up the road, uh, in between beating on the steering wheel and blowing the horn and uh, praying for everybody to get saved and right with God, I was thinking about this message and, and I looked over at my wife, I said, I said, I'm sitting here thinking about how much Jesus loved his church. About how much Jesus loved uh, I mean, this is in its infant stages. You know that, right? He chose his 12 disciples, started out with 12. By the time you get to Acts chapter number one, at the ascension of Jesus Christ, there were 120 names there in the upper room. So his little congregation grew from 12 hand-picked disciples uh, to 120. And then you get to chapter number two, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and Peter went out and preached, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, and Peter wasn't just preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, but there was 119 Holy Ghost filled church members standing behind him saying, sick on preacher, preach preacher, and 3,000 people got saved, and the church just began to explode. But Jesus loved the church even when it was just a handful of people. And the Bible tells us that he loved his church so much, watch this, this is what I said to my wife coming down the road, I said Jesus loved his church so much that he spent 24 seven with them. He loved his little church so much that he slept with them, that he ate with them, he traveled with them. Everywhere he went, he took them with him. Everything he preached, everything he taught, every miracle he performed, he had his church with him. And I'm telling you what, he loved his church, he spent his time with them. You know, when you love somebody, you wanna spend time with them. When you love somebody, you look for ways to spend time with them. And I know you're busy and I'm busy and boy, there's a lot going on. We live in a hectic, we, hit, we, we live in a busy uh, rat race of a society and of a world. But let me tell you something, when you love your church, you'll make time to spend time with your church. Jesus demonstrated his love for his church by his presence by his participation, by his pouring out of himself, by his preparing others to take his place when he would no longer be there. He demonstrated his love for his church and his passion for ministry and for people by putting aside his own reputation and taking upon himself the form of a servant and by immersing himself in the ministry to others. That's how much he loved his church. And he said to his disciples that you love one another as I have loved you. Do you love your church this morning? Jesus expressed his love. Jesus was an example of love. But thirdly, we see the expectation of Jesus Christ. His expectation is found in verse number 35. Look at what it says in John chapter 13. Verse 35, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. And I touched on this the other night. I know I preached on this a little bit recently, it seems like, but there's a lot of ways people can know that you're saved. There's a lot of ways that people can know you're a born again child of God. When's the last time somebody walked up to you in town and asked you if you're saved? 
When's the last time somebody walked up to you in, in town and says, you're a Christian, aren't you? It's amazing that when you're passionate about something, it just radiates off of your face. We walked into that, that church Wednesday night. I'd never been there. Got on the internet, found a good independent Baptist church that uses King James. Even though we were on vacation, we went to church Wednesday night, all right? We planned our whole day around church Wednesday night. Got dressed, went down there, walked in the door. They were passing out prayer sheets in the foyer. And the man passing out prayer sheets, he looked at me and he said, you're a pastor, aren't you? Amen. And I said, how'd you know? He said, I saw your halo. <laughs> His words, not mine. Now he was just being funny, but it made me feel good. Yeah. Amen. He said, There's, I can just tell. And I hadn't even sat and said a word, just walked in the door. Turns out I was the only one that had a tie on, so he kind of figured something was up. <laughs> But I'm telling you right now, when you're in town, people ought to be able to tell you're a child of God. Yes, sir. Amen. We, we was in the store yesterday, and there was a black lady walked in behind us, looked at my wife. She said, are y'all apostolic? <laughs> well, she said, no, we're Baptist. She said, oh, okay, okay. Now, she just thought that. She assumed we was apostolic because we was dressed like her and she had on a long, modest skirt. And Well, I didn't have on a skirt. Me and the boys didn't have on a skirt. I'll clarify that, but, well, I didn't have on a skirt. Let me just get that on the record. I'm glad. I, but, but she just looked at us and could tell there was something about us. And I'm just telling you right now, hey, God said, I love the church and I want you to love the church like I love the church and hereby shall people know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of things you and I could do that would tell the world that we're saved and that we love God and that we love the church, but there's nothing that will show it like loving the church. Right. Demonstrating that love. And Jesus was very quick to tell his church that he loved them and he was very quick to tell them that they ought to love one another the way he loved them and that he fully expected them to do that. John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus commanded. So let me just go ahead and say this morning that loving your church is not even an option. We're commanded to love one another. As Christians, Jesus expects us to love the church, demonstrate our love for the people of God and for the house of God. I know this is just a building. This is just a building. It's got a tin roof. It's got metal sides. It needs a coat of paint, and we're working on that, getting all the numbers together, trying to fix it up and make it look better, but this is just a building. We could take all these pews out and we could roller skate in here. We could put up basketball goals and we could play basketball in here. But can I just tell you something? This is not, to me, this is not just another building. This is the house of God. This is the sanctuary. And this is where God comes and meets with me and my family. And I love the church this morning. Yes, amen. Yeah. Let me give you three reasons why I love my church. Number one, I love my church because the Father is exalted here. You and I both know that there's not a lot of places you can go in society and see the Father magnified. You go to the ball games and they're magnifying the ball players. They're giving out shirts with their names on them. They're giving out bobbleheads. They're throwing their name up on the screen and throwing up their stats and they got the music going and getting everybody all fired up for somebody just cause they can catch a ball or throw a ball or hit a ball. But I'm telling you something, you come to church and there's something different about my church because at my church, we honor and glorify my heavenly father. I love my church because here, we do not elevate man or man's achievements, but rather we lift up and magnify the precious name of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter number 15, verse number five and six, the Bible says, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the obligation it is the opportunity, 
It is the privilege of the local church with one mind and one mouth to honor and glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what we do at this church. Every ministry that we have, every outreach that we have, everything that we do, all should point to the glorifying of God. We started the service out this morning singing to God be the glory, great things he hath done. And I'm telling you this morning, the, our God is worthy of our glory and he's worthy of our honor. And if the wor listen, the world's not gonna glorify him. God expects his people to honor and glorify him. And he said in one place, he says, if you don't praise me, he says, I'll get the, I'll get the rocks to cry out. Yeah. I'll get the rocks to yeah. cry out. Do you realize every time the birds sing, every time the wind blows and the tree, leaves and the trees rustle, it is the creation of God bringing glory and honor to him. God help us, don't let the birds and don't let the trees glorify and praise God more than his people do. Amen. He inhabits the praise of his people. I love my church because the Father is exalted here. Secondly, write this down. I love my church because my faith is established here. Yes. That's right. yes. I love my church because my faith gets weak sometimes. But I know where it can be strengthened. There's nothing that will build me up spiritually like a trip to my church. There's nothing that will remind me of God's wonder working power like a service down at my church. There's no place I'd rather be on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night than at my church. I just want to say this morning, I love my church. The God of heaven comes down and meets with me at this church. The Holy Spirit encourages my old discouraged heart down at my church. The word of God feeds my spiritual man at my church. My flesh gets what's coming to it at my church. My family gets the instruction that they need at my church. I love my church. My compass gets recalibrated at my church. My sin, greed, soul gets a reprieve at my church. My love for Jesus uh, gets rekindled at my church. My burden for lost souls gets rejuvenated at my church. My involvement in the ministry gets reemphasized at my church. I love my church. My understanding of God's word becomes more solid at my church. My faith in God grows stronger at my church. My admiration for Jesus Christ grows at my church. My awareness of Satan's devices becomes more clear to me at my church. My participation in the Great Commission becomes more passionate at my church. I said, I love my church. My faith gets established here. We got too many people using their weak faith as an excuse to not go to church. Preacher, I hadn't been there, I've just been struggling. That's like saying I don't eat because I'm starving to death. That's like saying I can't take a breath because I'm suffocating. I'm telling you, if your faith is weak, if your faith is being tried, if your faith is struggling, you need the church more than you've ever needed it before. Our faith gets established down here. That's right. The devil attacks our faith. The devil lies in your ears, whispers lies in defeat and discouragement in your ear all week long. And I'm telling you what, when you miss church, you miss the chance for God to strengthen your faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You don't need a pep talk. You don't need a vacation. You don't need a Red Bull. You just need some church, hallelujah. Yeah. Good for what ails you. Yes, sir. People come to church sometimes out of duty, out of obligation, not realizing how bad, how desperately they need something specific from God. And can I tell you something? Your heavenly father loves you so much. He has already customized, specifically made a message in the heart of the preacher to preach to you so that when you get here, you can get just exactly the dose, the prescription that you need for whatever it is that ails you. I'm telling you, I've been to church so many times and I thought I was the only one in the building God was working on me so much. I love when people come to me after the service and say, Pastor Schiff, if nobody needed that. If nobody needed that this message today, I did. And I think you're the tenth person to tell me that. And I listen, I don't have bugs at your house. I don't have hidden cameras at your house, I promise you. But God does. 
And when the man of God's preaching, or the man of God's preparing and studying a message, he knows exactly what to give the preacher to give to you. See, I'm just the waiter. I'm not the cook. Now, you don't know that, don't you? Some of y'all don't believe that. You walk in here and you got a craving for something. You got a need for something. God knows what you need. And I'm telling you, he's back in the kitchen. He's already got it cooked up. And I'm just the server. Come on. That's good. That's right. Come on, preacher. Motis, sir? Can I get you anything? This is what the cook cooked up. Eat ye all of it. Amen. I love my church because my faith is established here. You say, Pastor Sith, are you saying that your faith is weak sometimes? Oh, you have no idea. You have no idea. God will, God will lay something on my heart. And I go, Lord, are you for real? Are you for real? You want to do that? You want me to stand up and tell them that? Lord, you want me, you want me to stand up in our church and tell our people that we need $100,000 for asphalt. You want me to Come tell on. them that? <laughs> That's good. Woo! Amen! Lord, you, you, want me to, you want me to get more missionaries in here you want to have another Faith Promise Missions Conference. And you want us to take on more missionaries? We already support 80 some odd missionaries for $100 a month. Lord, you want us to take on some more? Lord says, yes, yeah, that's what I want to do. And sometimes my faith gets tested. <laughs> I remember the time Dr. Keene asked me to come up to Gatlinburg. He was presenting the burden for this new Mongolian New Testament translation. They didn't have a Bible in their language. Three million people in, in Mongolia without a Bible in their language. And boy, God burdened his heart. And God laid it on Brother Mickey Kofer's heart to translate it and get some translators together. And I was sitting in that meeting in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Brother Keenan just randomly asked me to come. I don't even know why. We really wasn't that close. He said, I want you to come. I walked in, sat down in that meat, and sat down at the table. There was a binder in front of me with all the, all the stuff, and I just sat there overwhelmed. And of course, being a missionary, having been a missionary in Africa, I fully appreciated what they were trying to do, and I was 100% for it, thought it was awesome. And toward the end of that meeting, the Holy Ghost said to me, Stacey, I want you to go back to your church, and I want you to raise $10,000 for this project. And I said, Lord, we can't do that. I said, but we can probably raise 2000 We'll probably raise 2000 I'm not making this up. He was sitting there. When I walked in and stood in the pulpit at Pleasant View Baptist Church, and I told the church they're translating the Bible, they're fixing to translate the Bible into Mongolian for the first time, and it's going to be an overwhelming project. And the Holy Ghost told me to tell you that he wants our church to raise $10,000 for that project. But, of course, I, don't worry. I told God that y'all didn't have that much money and that we could only probably come up with 2000 So relax. It's okay. We're just going to try to raise 2000 now, that's how honest and stupid I was. Within about two or three weeks, we had 13,800 and some odd dollars. And I was so humble that my lack of faith. And I had to come to church three times a week at least for my faith to get strengthened because sometimes I have faith problems. Anybody in here besides Pastor Schiff would ever have faith problems? Come on now. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, you need to come up here and finish this message. You could help us now. You could help me. I'm telling you, if you don't ever doubt God, if you don't ever, if you never stagger at his promises, you could help this preacher out. Just come up here and tell me how it is you're doing it. I'm telling you, I need church because it establishes my faith. Number three, write this down. I love my church because of the focus that is emphasized here. Yes. Now, I, Calvary Baptist Church is just different. If you hadn't figured that out, this church is different. That's right. 
Every church is different. I, I, every church, every independent Baptist church is different. It's an autonomous body of believers and they've got their own personality and they've got their own people and they've got their way of doing things. But Calvary Baptist Church is just unique. I, I, the first time I ever came to this church, I guess it's okay for me to tell this because it's our third anniversary of being here. This is three years ago God moved us up here and we joined this church and I was able to be your pastor. But before that, eight months prior to that, I'd come up here for a prayer conference with right. Brother Beckham. Yeah. Yeah. Long story, long story. We'd had the prayer, national prayer conference at our church down in, in South Carolina, but through a series of events, he moved his membership up here, joined your church here, and with Brother Giovanelli as the pastor, felt led to have the conference here. And because I was a member of his board, I came up to be a part of the conference. And I remember, I'd never been to Baltimore before, never been to this part of the country before, but I remember walking in this back door of Calvary Baptist Church on that Monday evening for the first night of the prayer conference. And there was just an amazing spirit here. There was, a, there was a very noticeable spirit of God here. And I remember being here during that meeting and, and meeting some of you and just being in the service. And man, I went back home. My wife said, so what's it like in Dundalk? And I said, well... I'm just going to be honest with you, ain't a whole lot to write home about. But that church is unbelievable. That's what I said to my wife. Now, I didn't hurt nobody's feelings when I said that, did I? I lived on a four-acre farm with a log cabin and had horses and had room to move, you know. And so when I came up here, all I saw was these houses stacked on top of one another. I said, I don't know how these people live like this, man. I don't know how they do it. I'm going to tell you how they do it. They get to go to church like this three times a week. <laughs> hey, I'll put up with the traffic to go to church here. I'll put up with the crowded streets. I'll put up, I'll put up without no elbow room. I'll put up with them going to, McDonald's, going to Walmart in their pajamas to go to church at Calvary Baptist Church. I'll put up with it to go to church here. I'm telling you, there's something special about this place. I just want to say I love my church this morning. And I love my church because of the focus that is emphasized here. There's a focus on salvation. Can I get a witness that that's important, that you focus on salvation? Hey, if you don't believe Jesus died for the sins of every man, you won't like my church. <laughs> if you don't believe that the blood that was shed on Calvary has the power to save every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl, you won't like going to my church. If you believe that only some were elected to be saved and others cannot be saved, you'll hate it at my church. If a whosoever gospel bothers you, you'll be very bothered at my church. If hearing that Jesus died for not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world, if that bothers you, you won't like it at our church. But if you like altar calls, and you like invitations, and you like people getting saved every single service, you'll love my church. If seeing personal workers leading people to Christ in their pews and in the altar, if that blesses you, you'll love my church. If seeing people say, gives you a warm fuzzy feeling inside you'll get that feeling down at my church if you love to hear the wondrous story of Jesus who died for me and you love to hear preaching on the old rugged cross and, and if you enjoy hearing the story of Jesus and you want the preacher to write on your heart every word you'll love it at my church if seeing dope heads and drunks get saved and their lives change brings you joy, you can get that at my church. If you wanna be in a place where the Great Commission is our great concern, you'll love my church. The gospel message is preached clearly and biblically and powerfully and frequently at my church. Bus kids and first time visitors learn that Jesus loves them and died for them at my church. I love my church. Salvation is emphasized. What good is having a softball team? What good is having all these things that a lot of churches are striving to have if lost people are not getting saved? Not only is there a focus on salvation, but secondly, there's a focus on service. 
Now, whether you believe it or not, God's got big plans for you. Amen. Your daddy might have told you you was an accident. Your mama might have slapped you upside the head and called you names. They might have picked on you at school. But you are no accident. And at Calvary Baptist Church, there are no big eyes and little U's. You have a vital role to play in this church and you have a vital role to play in the kingdom of God. One of the most awesome things about Calvary Baptist Church is there's room for everybody to get involved. Whether it's serving on staff, whether it's volunteering in the Christian school or helping knock doors or pass out tracts or serve in the nursing homes, the retirement homes, the rescue missions, teen ministries, children's ministries, the choir, the nursery, the grounds, maintenance, senior citizens ministries, hospital visitations, prayer breakfast, missions, you name it. We have every possible ministry opportunity that you could ever imagine here at Calvary Baptist Church. If you want to use your talents for the honor and glory of God, you can do that at my church. If you feel the urge to get involved in something that will yield lifelong fruit, you can do that at this church. If you want to invest in things of eternal value, you can do that at my church. If somebody wants to let God use them to make a difference in this world, it can happen at my church. If you love loving God and you love loving people and you want to do it any time, all the time, you can do it at my church. The focus on service, a place to serve. We got too many people looking for a church wanting to know, what can this church do for me and my family? If I can borrow a statement and hijack a statement and rework a statement by the late President John F. Kennedy, ask not what your church can do for you, but ask what you can do for your church. We went to the old historic Williamsburg, Virginia settlement. Oh, I love that stuff. Man, I tell you what, those were back in the good old days. I got one grunt and two, are you kidding me? And there was a bridge that went from the visitor center out to the old settlement. And there was a timeline on that bridge. Some of y'all maybe have seen that. They got these plaques. And as you walk down through there, it gives you this date and something significant that happened. Starting with way back at the Mayflower and all that. And you go and you see everything. And then on the way back to the visitor center, the timeline on the other side starts and it gets more and more modern till you get to the very last one. And every one of those plaques that have somebody's name and a date and what they did. And the very last one, right before you walk off of that bridge, it said, a bronze plate, it said, your name here. What are you doing to make a difference? Amen. And I saw that. Anybody, anybody else seen, seen that beside me? Y'all seen that? I should have took a picture of it. Can I tell you something? If you want to make a difference, you have the opportunity to do that yes. at my church. That's right. Amen. Yeah. I don't care who you are and where you come from. Focus on salvation. Focus on service. Lastly, we see a focus on sanctification. I'm talking about a church I'm talking about a church that emphasizes certain things. Salvation, one of them. Service, one of them. Sanctification, one of the distinct commands to the man of God and to the house of God is found in Ezekiel 44, verse 23. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. listening to the news reports about yesterday, the tragedy at Charlottesville, the tragedy, Amen. the yes. insanity, the un, unjustifiable yes. lunatics yes. that were on the news yesterday. 
You say, which side are you talking about? I'm talking about both sides. And they were talking about what happened. And they had a Catholic priest on there, or he was a priest or Episcopalian guy. And the news anchor said, what can we do? What can we do to fix this divide? What can we do to stop what's happening today from happening? And he made a statement. I couldn't believe he said it. I couldn't believe they let him say it, and I can't believe they didn't edit him out. He said, we've got to get back to teach and right from wrong in our homes and in our churches. And I thought, well, that's a novel idea. That's a novel concept for parents to teach their children right from wrong and for churches to get back to telling their people, you can't act that way, you can't do that. That's not right. I'm glad I'm in a church where they focus on our sanctification. And if you like having one foot in the muck and the mire and one foot in the choir, you won't like my church. If you like to, but if you like to learn what God says about sin and the filthiness of the flesh, you'll like my church. If preaching that names sin and points sin out plainly and pointedly bothers you, you won't like my church. But if you're striving to get close to the Lord and you want to learn what it is that might be hindering that, you'll love my church. If preaching on your sinful habits and ungodly activities and unhealthy relationships bother you, you won't like my church. Uh, but if you'd like to be reminded from time to time how much God loves you and how much God hates sin in your life, you'll love my church. If you enjoy seeing young people prepared for the challenges of life, come to my church. If being taught what it means to live a separated, holy, godly life is important, uh, then you'll want to come to my church. Sin and worldliness is condemned and holiness and godliness is exalted at our church. If being equipped for the work of the ministry means something to you, you need to come to my church. Backslid church members are revived and refreshed at my church. Carnal Christians are rebuked and restored at my church. Wayward believers are put back on the right track at my church. I said I love my church. My responsibilities as a daddy and as a husband become more vivid to me at my church. My wife gets instruction about how to love her husband and how to raise godly children at church. My children learn how to obey and honor their parents at my church. Jesus loved, still loves the church. Let me ask you a question this morning. How is your love for the church? Jesus loved his church. He expressed it. He set an example and he expects us to do the same. My question to you this morning is, how is your relationship with the body of Christ? You might be here today and you've never even been saved. If you died right now, you'd bust hell wide open. And Jesus died on the cross so that you won't have to do that. He died on the cross so that you could know without a shadow of a doubt where you're going when you die. You could die anytime, anywhere. Yesterday, people were standing in the street hollering about whatever they was passionate about. The next thing you know, a car comes running up through there, runs over, hurts 19 of them, kill one of them. Virginia State Police is trying to respond in a helicopter, something malfunctioned. It crashed out in the middle of the woods next to a golf course, blowed up, burned up right there, killed two state troopers. You don't never know. You never know. But at this church, you can find out how to be saved. At my church, you got a bunch of people that are going to heaven and they want to take you with us. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Our personal workers are standing by. I wonder this morning, would there be somebody, would there be somebody here this morning that would say, Pastor Shiflet, I'm not 100% sure if I died right now that I would go to heaven. And I would appreciate you praying for me. I would appreciate you praying for me. I would appreciate you praying for me. I would appreciate you praying for me.